Good afternoon. I'm Daryl West, Vice President of Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution. And I'm pleased to welcome you to our webinar on keeping your workplace safe from AI and surveillance. So we live in a time of rapid change. In the last year, we have seen COVID compress what might have been five years of digital transformation into five months or perhaps even five weeks. AI is being deployed in many different sectors, including in the employment area. Organizations are using algorithms to screen resumes, assess job candidates, and monitor employees. There are concerns about the possible impact in terms of personal privacy, bias, and discrimination. To help us understand these issues, we're delighted to have two distinguished experts with us. Alex Engler is the David Rubenstein Fellow in Governance Studies at Brookings. He writes about AI deployment in the employment area and issues that we should watch. Kimberly Hauser is an Assistant Clinical Professor of Business Law and the Law of Emerging Technologies at the University of North Texas. If you have questions for our panelists, you can email them to us at events at brookings.edu, that's events at brookings.edu, or tweet at brookings.gov by using hashtag AI governance. So I wanna start with Alex. So you wrote a Brookings paper recently that uh, people can find at brookings.edu. The paper is entitled, Auditing Employment Algorithms for Discrimination. And you say that algorithmic hiring systems are proliferating. How are companies using AI in the employment area? Yeah, thanks, Daryl, and, and thanks for um, hosting us today. So there was a recent study by Mercer that said 55% of human resource leaders are now using some form of artificial intelligence or predictive algorithms in hiring. And they're using these at a, almost every stage you can think of in the hiring process. Um, this includes stuff like LinkedIn and Monster and Indeed, which connect candidate profiles with specific uh, job postings. It then includes a step where um, algorithms analyze resumes, maybe just uh, to see broad level of qualifications, maybe attached to a specific job or type of job. Um, there's specialized assessments where you might play some sort of games that was designed to, you know, as a specialized questionnaire to see if someone uh, will do particularly well at a certain type of job. That's another brand of companies. And then there's a whole series of uh, automated, of automated um, interviews, which may use things like facial analysis or may use things like the um, tone and cadence of your voice, as well as also the content of what you're saying through uh, transcription, taking what you say and turning it into text and then analyzing with natural language processing that text. So if you can, if you can think of something in the job hiring funnel, there's an algorithm that's at least attempting to play a part in that. And this is where you might really start to get concerned. There's so many different algorithms playing a part in this process that if there are even small issues, much less large ones, they might uh, prolific throughout and uh, build on one another. And this might lead to concerns, all sorts of things about transparency. Do people know uh, what they're being evaluated on and fairness and discrimination as well as privacy? And, and so this is where this concern is coming from is this you know, large proliferation of the, the numbers and uses of these systems. The great overview of how companies are starting to use these kinds of tools. And you started to get into this, but are there things that particularly worry you? I mean, you mentioned the issues of privacy, issues of discrimination. Like, how should we be thinking about those kinds of applications? The, the one that really sticks out to me, and this is what I wrote the paper about, uh, is discrimination in, in hiring. The reason this sticks out is because, you know, you know, I think broadly people agree that sort of equitable economic growth and, and equitable opportunities in the labor market is really important. Um, and this hasn't been going well. So really uh, impactful meta-analysis in 2017, it looked at 28 studies and showed that there was no change in the level of hiring discrimination against African-Americans over 25 years. And um, the level of hiring discrimination against uh, Latinos had decreased only modestly. So 25 years with very little progress for African-Americans and Latinos in hiring. Um, and so this is to say that people aren't necessarily doing a great job. Um, but, you know, when we look at these algorithms, they're built on historical data. They're built on data from the past. They're built on top of this system that we have very clear evidence is, is fundamentally flawed. Um, and when you look at the individual types of algorithms that 
uh, they're using, there's not obvious evidence that they're inherently going to be better. So we have a, a flawed previous system. And then building on top of this, we have new algorithmic processes that are likely to reflect those past biases. We've seen this in bias against uh, women and people with disabilities in resumes. We've seen this against uh, African-Americans and dialectic variations of speech. We've seen this uh, against darker skin color uh, and, um, uh, and very likely, very, very likely people with disabilities when it comes to facial analysis um, for young women in uh, STEM uh, ad job advertisements. I mean, you can just almost go on forever. The number of examples uh, in studies is, is really compelling that this is very likely to be um, a systemic problem. So discrimination is the one that sticks out to me. It's not the only uh, potential concern with these systems. So Kim, uh, Alex just mentioned that humans don't do such a great job either uh, in comparing uh, uh, humans uh, versus uh, the uh, technology. And you actually have done uh, research on bias and algorithms and looked in particular at how the algorithms might actually be helpful in reducing human unconscious bias. So can you tell us a little bit about your research and what you found? Uh, actually, you are muted. Could you unmute yourself, please? I came about this looking at the tech industry specifically because they are known for having such uh, low levels of women and underrepresented minority employees, especially at the in the tech positions and at the leadership level. And I was curious to know, you know, there there were some highly publicized, very overt cases of. Uh, harassment and discrimination, but it just seemed to me like this was more of a systemic problem. And I wanted to uh, kind of explore that and see if I could, you know, really figure out what was going on. And I had uh, read a number of um, reports about unconscious bias and how that might be playing into it. And, you know, what I discovered, there was a, a survey done by Human Capital Institute and they indicated that uh, about 80% of leaders were using gut feelings to make <laughs> employment decisions. And that just kind of uh, cemented this idea that I, what I think is going on is that people um, in general are not intentionally discriminating against women or certain groups in the tech industry, but because they have these biases of which they're not aware, they keep choosing the same type of people over and over. And a lot of that has to do with things like affinity bias, you know? Uh, oh, you went, you played lacrosse? Oh, wonderful. Oh, I, I went there too. It's, it's just having a connection with the people who are interviewing them. So you kind of develop a preference for them. Um, that's not to say that discrimination doesn't exist. It, it certainly does. But I wanted to explore more that aspect. And uh, I had done a, a fair amount of legal research on a lot of these lawsuits and discovered that there, there really isn't a legal remedy for this. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's, it's disparate impact. You can, you know, easily prove that. Well, that, well that's really not the case. Our, our employment law is very insufficient to cover these types of um, subjective decision making that leads to discriminatory results. So uh, I looked into this idea of artificial intelligence because a lot of scholars were indicating, um, you know, this is really dangerous. We shouldn't be uh, using it in these situations. And what I found was that there were uh, companies that were actually developing artificial intelligence to actually uh, make these employment decisions more equitable. And they started out very big. I, I, it's evolved, but they start out very basically by saying, okay, well, let's take protected factors out and make decisions. But then they discovered that the algorithms could develop proxies and still be discriminatory. Um, but then what they started doing, which is kind of what Alex's paper gets into, is developing AI that could actually audit AI decisions. And that's when I, I really got interested because I think there is a lot of opportunity to develop this field um, to make employment decisions more objective. It's just AI has to be developed responsibly. 
Okay, those are all uh, great points, and we certainly do need to build responsible AI. And Kim, uh, you mentioned some possible technical fixes in uh, the work that you've done in terms of historic reviews, uh, looking at the uh, data, uh, opening the black box of these uh, algorithms. Could you talk a little bit about uh, those things and how they might help fix some of the issues that have popped up with these AI applications? Yes, um, the, the two main issues, and I, again, I, I oversimplify a bit, but the two main issues um, that uh, Alex alluded to are first, uh, the data. You know, we're taking this data, it's not clean, it has historical prejudices in it, and then we're running algorithms on it and surprised when it turns out discriminatory results. Uh, so one of the things that I, um, I read a lot of paper, <laughs> scientific papers, and discover that there are really ways to not only audit the databases to locate these, uh, uh, these uh, I guess you'd call them discriminatory databases, but a lot of times what happens is you'd have unbalanced data. And the, you know, the example everyone uses is Amazon. And they say, well, Amazon developed an algorithm and it excluded women's resumes. And, and they use that as an example of why you should not use artificial intelligence in you know, resume sorting, which was what they were doing. Um, but really it, it was more a case of very unbalanced data, meaning that they were taking uh, historical resumes, which came from 90% male, uh, using those as evidence of these are the people we hired. And then it, you know, it just learned to exclude female resumes. Well, had they balanced the data either by reduction or boosting, they might have had a different result. Reduction is where you would say, okay, we have um, and I'm, you know, reducing the numbers to make this easier. We have 10 resumes from women. We have 90 resumes from men. You would reduce the male resumes to 10. So it's equal with the 10 from female, or you'd create synthetic data and increase the 10 female resumes to 90. So you're comparing apples to apples. With the black box, that's a little bit different. There's been a lot of calls for explainability, um, which is very difficult when you're using machine learning because you don't really know why uh, the algorithm produced an, a result, but there are some um, technical fixes that can work on this. One is called um, counterfactual testing. So with counterfactual testing, what you're doing is you take your model that you've used, you use the protected factors, you find out what the output is, and then you remove the protected factors, see what the output is. And if they're the same, you have a good sense that it's, it's a relatively fair algorithm. Um, another uh, way is called um, quantitative input influence. And what this does, which I, I think it's really interesting, it doesn't open the black box, but what the program is able to do is determine which categories, it lists the categories in order of importance and then instead of uh, you know, having an explanation for why it made the decision, you could see what it was looking at most often to kind of uh, guess what it was taking into an account. So if, for example, it was taking gender into account as number one, you know that that, that might not be a good, good algorithm to use. Okay, uh, Alex, uh, Kim mentioned uh, the, the idea of uh, doing uh, audits of uh, uh, one sort or another. And in your paper, you actually do call for algorithmic uh, audits, but you suggest there are a variety of things we need to check to make sure those audits actually are effective. Could you explain uh, your view on algorithmic audits and what would be required for them to help make these tools less discriminatory and less biased? Yeah, um, this is where things, I think, get quite tricky and you have to start blending the technical and the sociological and the incentives um, to really get anywhere meaningful. Uh, first, just, you know, at a really broad level, it is true that algorithms have the potential to make strides in combating discrimination. That possibility definitely exists. If 
every single hiring algorithm was really, really robustly tested with lots of investment into the process for making it less discriminatory. There are ways in, you know, including balancing and counterfactual testing, though both of those have limitations, including, you know, working to improve the modeling process itself, that the data is one source of um, bias, but the modeling process as well can be one. You, you can make those things uh, better, at least, uh, at least, um, if not perfect, you can make them uh, better. It's not obvious to me that the socio-technical incentives are there, right? It takes engineering time of quality, well-qualified, expensive data scientists to do this work. And that is work they're doing instead of developing a model for a different job, or instead of developing a report to pitch a different client, or instead of developing a new feature for your product. And so while um, it's true that these things can happen, oh, by the way, also data collection to, to balance, to create more representative and thorough data sets also can be very expensive and time consuming. Um, and so you have to wonder if you look at a relatively competitive environment with a lot of new companies, are they putting in the time to make these systems definitely more valuable uh, in terms of, a, um, a, you know, more fair in terms of discrimination? They all make strong claims. All of their websites advertise on the fact that they um, are, are objective, right? They put a lot of sort of blind faith in the idea of algorithmic objectivity, or at least that's part of their sales pitch. Um, and that's not to say they're all the same, but they are all making that claim. Um, and it's, you know, it's not very obvious to an employer, it's not going to be very obvious to most employers who are contracting with these vendors, which ones are, are really taking it seriously and, and which ones aren't. Um, and so the incentives make you kind of think, well, there's probably some variation in how thorough uh, these firms are in, in, in sort of self-assessing. And this might lead you, as it led me, to think, well, what we really need to hear is some sort of independent verification, some sort of independent check um, on the, the, bareness, um, the fairness of these systems, which, you know, I'll, just as a reminder, this is, you know, not just something I would like to happen. This is current law. It's Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which, uh, as well as the, um, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act and the uh, Age, and, um, Age and Employment Act, right? These are various pieces of federal legislation that say you can't discriminate against all these sorts of qualifications in, in hiring. Um, and we're currently just not enforcing that in any way on algorithms. Uh, and so one thing you might do is to say, we're gonna require as New York City is considering doing some sort of independent um, audit in which a third party comes in and evaluates on a bunch of technical levels and, and maybe also process levels, uh, whether or not the algorithm is being developed or, or fair. And that's the general idea. It's that, well, yes, hypothetically, these can be more fair, but are they, and how do we punish the actors that aren't putting in the time and energy to make fair and, and frankly, legal systems and reward the companies that are being responsible actors in the space. And so far, we don't have a clear incentive. We don't have a clear process for doing that. So Kim, I know you've thought about the privacy issue in regard to uh, some of these uh, workplace uh, applications, and we are starting to see some new policies and new regulations uh, come online. So obviously the European Union has uh, taken a pretty strong stance uh, in this area. State of California, uh, Virginia have passed uh, laws in this area. What are the promising models that you see to deal with the privacy angle on workplace issues? Sorry about that. Um, I do think that uh, there are aspects of the GDPR out of Europe that would work well in this particular area. Um, I also, however, think there are aspects of the GDPR that can inhibit innovation um, because of its strictness. But I think uh, to a certain degree, we want people to know first that their data is being collected what the purpose of the collection is and how it's being used, but also with whom it's being shared. And I think people don't really have a good sense that their data that they provide to, you know, wherever they provide it, then it keeps traveling outward where they have no control over it. But to me, one of the biggest issues with this is really um, what I would call derived data. So you provide information, you know, voluntarily, but there are many ways that uh, you know, the internet or your social media is mined that pulls in other factors 
it combines it with this information and it creates these uh, predictions about you, predictions about your behavior, uh, but it also can tend to reveal very um, personal things about you, things you wouldn't even imagine that a machine could pick up on. And I think without a federal, uh, an overarching federal privacy law, this is going to continue be, to be the case. And our data is just, uh, it's being shared, but also this these profiles of our personality are also being shared. And I think that presents an enormous risk. Alex, what are the promising policy models that you see? Is the EU approach the way to go? Is what California has uh, done, is that likely to be uh, promising? Uh, what are the best ideas that you've seen out there? So just one quick note about Illinois, which is a state has done I won't say necessarily a ton, but more than most other people. So on uh, AI for job interviews, they now have a, a law that requires notification of the use of an algorithm in an automated job interview or an asynchronous job interview, as well as um, some explanation of what that system is doing. I'm probably unfortunately quite skeptical that that information is meaningful, right? It may be like it's using your face and your tone. Right. Um, and so it's, it's not necessarily the transparency aspect of this is, is difficult to make valuable to people. But the fact that they know it, at least they're being analyzed by AI is, is useful. Um, and it also enables them to request that their inter video interviews uh, be deleted and the companies must comply with that, I think, within 30 days. And so there's there's certainly some valuable parts of that Illinois um, requirement. The New York City legislation um, does go further in terms of discrimination in that it would require these bias audits. Um, I think the really big question is how is that going to be enforced? What, you know, who, do you, how do you require that the, uh, the organization that's doing it doesn't have a financial dependency and is independent and still gets um, what you need, which is data and uh, model and uh, code access, right? So when a third party has to come in and really get to the internals of how a company operates. And, and that's a concern to these companies, one, because if they're doing anything wrong, it's going to become pretty obvious pretty quickly. And, and two, because they may be concerned about the proprietary nature of the systems that they're using. Um, but that's really, that's really what you need. You cannot... Um, ask questions, you cannot do this through a QA. and a you cannot just talk to the developer, you have to do um, a really rigorous audit. And, and frankly, it needs to be somewhat adversarial. You need to assume that the company is um, not necessarily complying perfectly or not necessarily giving you all the information. Um, and that's why uh, the I am very sympathetic to calls in the US for the EEOC to get involved, the EEOC, which is in charge of, enfor of enforcing at the federal level um, employment discrimination. Um, currently, you know, there was a letter sent by a number of senators to the EEOC saying, hey, why, what's preventing you from going and doing a, a big data collection from these vendors of algorithmic hiring tools and seeing uh, what they're what they're doing, and maybe if there's if there are problems here. And um, the response letter is not uh, public, but from my understanding, the EEOC says they're not really sure they can do that. They're not really sure that they um, have the capacity to to do it. They don't have like the the actual staff talent to do it, um, and that they usually respond to uh, individual complaints about. Um, discrimination. Now, that's kind of a, a problem here. One, because individual complaints about discrimination are, are hard to prove at all. Unfortunately, it's very hard to take these courts as an individual, even if you're sitting face to face with someone and prove racial or gender discrimination successfully in a court, even though we obviously know what happens. Um, but you as an individual, you don't even necessarily know in, in, in most states outside of Illinois in the US, whether or not you're getting any, you know, whether or not you're being analyzed by an AI, whether it's analyzing your voice or your face or your, uh, your language or your, or your resume. And so you may not even know what's happening and thus it becomes very hard to prove discrimination or, or enough to go to the EEOC and, and lead to an investigation. So uh, the individuals sort of have lost some influence to start the process and the EEOC, which I personally think should um, uh, be doing more on this seems like they're waiting for something that uh, uh, can't necessarily happen. Um, it's not exactly clear what breaks that um, logjam. Uh, hopefully, it may it may be Congress saying, "Well, okay, here's some funding and here's a mandate," but it's it's time that that someone 
uh, went and did that. In the United States, that's what I'm, I'm most hopeful for, which is a, a, a role of the EEOC in sort of an active investigative um, uh, role. And that is a great uh, point in terms of agency expertise and some of the problems in that area, because we are starting to see federal agencies get tougher in their enforcement practices. But in some cases, they don't have the actual expertise to follow up effectively. So uh, that's an issue that uh, policymakers really need to be thinking about. Can I say uh, so one, note like on to... that, one note on that, Terrell? There is a sure. really interesting development um, led by US Digital Service and the Office of Personnel Management. And I think I'm leaving out an agency um, in which they jointly hired like 13 data scientists across a series of agencies, um, which is which attracted a ton of interest and a ton of applicants. I honestly think uh, as someone who's taught many data scientists interested in public service, there is demand for people who want to go to the federal government and do this job. The problem in my entire experience working in this field has been the government demand, the ability to hire people in the right uh, salaries and with mentorship, with the right titles. Uh, and there's some recognition already of changes coming both in um, the federal hiring process, moving to something that's more based on subject matter expertise, which is great, and also creating titles like the title data scientist, which doesn't exist formally, but now there's an informal title of that at the federal government. That's the type of thing you would want to do, hire people who are interested in this type of work and who have a background in being skeptical and, and uh, of understanding this research. That's a really good start. Uh, and I'll mention one other quick point about capacity because this is so important and it's it's going to really cross all of government regulation, not just employment algorithms, is that of data access. If, if we can't figure out this problem of data and model access, if you're sending, uh, you know, subpoenas, administrative subpoenas or enforcement subpoenas and you're getting PDFs or boxes of documents back um, or, or documentation or you're getting written answers, that's not that's not gonna solve these problems. We need governments, uh, agencies who can request and enforce requests for data access and then uh, the talent to investigate that data to, to, to find and un unveil problems. Great, no, thank you. Those are important points. So I'd like to involve the audience in this discussion. We're already starting to get some uh, questions and just want to remind people, if you have uh, questions, you can email us at events at brookings.edu. That's events at brookings.edu or you can tweet at BrookingsGov by using hashtag AI governance and ask your question that way. So uh, one question that has come in is from Irina of CBS News, and she wants to know, how has the pandemic affected employer use of these technologies? Uh, is the shift to remote work making surveillance tools more prevalent? And I'll just give a quick answer and then happy to turn it over uh, to uh, either one of you uh, to extend those uh, comments. Uh, I read it, the short uh, answer to your question is yes. The shift to remote work has made uh, surveillance tools more prevalent uh, because people are working remotely. Uh, and so almost by definition, uh, they are using digital tools to uh, do uh, most of their jobs, either through uh, Zoom video conferences uh, or other uh, types of online uh, platforms. And the issue is that many organizations are starting to incorporate surveillance uh, in their monitoring of employees. So uh, managers have this concern, people are working at home, there's not a supervisor kind of directly uh, paying attention. And so they are being tempted and are actually using surveillance tools for uh, uh, worker productivity, to monitor what workers are doing, are they working the hours that they say they're doing, how they're using their time. And there are all sorts of digital tools uh, for uh, this type of monitoring, you know, from uh, keystroke uh, logging that can actually uh, monitor what you are typing, uh, what appears on your uh, keyboard, uh, to the use of video uh, monitors, uh, and a number of other uh, tools. So uh, this is a problem. Uh, we actually have a, a tech tank uh, blog on this topic of workplace surveillance. We also have a Tech Tank a podcast uh, that deals with uh, this subject. You can find either one of those at uh, brookings.edu. But uh, I don't know if uh, Alex or Kim, if either of you have any comments on how COVID has, effect, has affected the degree which employers are using uh, some of these uh, 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 new types of technologies. Alex, we're... 
were you raising your hand? <laughs> oh, I was I was gesturing to you. Oh, you're both way too polite here. So. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say, uh, yeah, you mentioned a lot of the uh, productivity tracking software that they're using now that they uh, did not use before. But another aspect uh, that's concerning is, you know, viewing into people's homes. Um, you know, it, you know, what if you see things behind them that, uh, you know, as an employer, you don't like, you know, political beliefs, uh, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, guns hanging on the wall, you know, there's, you know, being able to peek into someone's home while they're working does concern me just because, you know, everything in your home you're used to, you don't think of it as being um, objectionable or concerning to anyone. Um, but I, I think there is a, another aspect of the privacy issue, not just with the, with the computer tracking, but just with having a camera, uh, you know, on someone in their own home. Yeah, no, those just, are great points. And a lot of people are working uh, from home using company devices, mm -hmm. not understanding that the law allows companies to monitor what they're doing even if they're working at home, if they are doing it on a company device. So people should certainly be aware of that. And, you know, we need to do a much better job just in terms of worker notifications of what uh, companies are uh, doing in this uh, area. Uh, just, Alex, anything else you would like to add? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, first of all, if, if you, this is a new topic for anyone, um, Adam Satoriano, who's a New York Times reporter, um, wrote up a piece called How My Boss Monitors Me While I Work From Home, in which he voluntarily downloaded one of these um, pieces of, uh, of software and then shared it with his editor. And it's a fun read. Uh, also, it's terrifying. Um, and this is uh, one of the this software has uh, GPS tracking on his phone, as well as um, screen capture of what his computer is doing, as well as a random uh, every 10 minute webcam photo of, of him is sitting in front of his computer. Um, and you're it's sort of terrifying to sort of think about this, you know, well, this must be an exception. There's a quote that I can't get out of my head from Tommy Wire, Weir, who's the CEO of one of these companies called Enable. And he's been talking about how the uh, incredible proliferation of the software since COVID. And he goes, in the next six to 12 months, it will become so pervasive that it disappears. Essentially saying that it's so common that you're not going to think about it anymore in the immediate future. And that quote's really stuck with me. And I think, you know, we we have very, very few restrictions on how this data can be used. Again, if you're on a work device um, and if it's within working hours. And I think, you know, the limits on employee surveillance are pretty endless. We're just gonna keep getting better at building little sensors and better at building monitoring and better at creating algorithms that predict something and better at the nudges that increase productivity. And so if we wanna set boundaries on what can be done, we, we might want to do that because they're, they're not, the technology is not going to create them. The technology is going to keep enabling surveillance pretty much perpetually in ways that, um, as uh, Tommy Orr says, will disappear, will become, will become used to them because of their uh, pervasiveness. And so um, maybe a time to, to consciously uh, consider um, what boundaries are reasonable, what places to say, this, this is too far. We don't care if it's a work computer, we don't care if it's home. You can't take pictures of people's, uh, um, you know, bedrooms, right? Um, it, it, it might be time for that type of reflection. Yeah, because you're exactly right. There are very few boundaries right now. And in a lot of cases, workers don't even know what type of monitoring uh, tools are being used, how long the information is being stored, and to what uses uh, that information is uh, being Just One One quick note on that. I think th there was a moment where um, a Microsoft set of tools uh, created... Um, a, essentially a surveillance dashboard of employees and they just added it to like Microsoft Office. I, I think I could be slightly confusing which product, but it, it essentially added to an existing set of products, a workplace management tool. And so you could have gone on continually using the same uh, software you're using. And suddenly there is now an, a surveillance component that you had no idea was happening. And, um, you know, that could be a concern for, um, you know, any cloud-based tool or any chat thing, right? You think about like Slack, obviously emails are very, are being monitored in, in quite a lot of places. Um, and some level of surveillance, I think, you know, there's been a few studies that are saying 50, 60, 70% of companies uh, surveyed or, are actively using um, um, some form of uh, sort of digital surveillance. So it's, yeah, it's certainly pervasive. 
Yeah, uh, so the, getting back to the issue of employment. Let me just algorithms. say one more thing about the Microsoft uh, tool. Um, if your company does choose to use that as an employee, you have no option to opt out. Okay, no, uh, thanks for that addition. Uh, so getting back to the use of employment algorithms, uh, James has a question. He wants to know what advice either one of you have for job seekers who basically are being subjected to these types of recruiting and management uh, practices uh, by uh, either their potential employer or their actual employer, uh, are there things people can do to protect themselves? Yeah, yeah, there's, um, God, I, it's, it's so tempting to say run in the opposite direction, but I, you know, that's not an option. These things are so pervasive that for many jobs, you can't, you can't just avoid them as an individual. Um, for resumes, there are tools that will uh, analyze your resume to see whether or not it will look good to other algorithms analyzing your resume. Um, I, I, they, they may be, there may be free trials for those and they may cost a small amount of money. Um, so as an individual, you might want to try and find one of those to, to get an algorithmic assessment of your resume before you pass it to other algorithms. Um, it, it may do stuff as simple as say that having a resume broken up into two columns is not as easily read or something, right? Which is a completely ridiculous uh, that, that there's no signal, there's no value in that. Um, but that might be the case that that's not as valuable uh, or that's not as effective a, a communication strategy to an algorithmic resume tool. Um, so, so that's one. Um, for video interviews, there are some guides online, for instance, you know, uh, figuring out how to make sure you're facing a camera and um, making eye contact is, is one. Um, God, I feel gross giving these suggestions, right? Because we're it's sort of you're forced into this ridiculous uh, into this ridiculous scenario. Um, and another is to make sure you're well lit. Um, there's a relationship in some of these systems between uh, lighting, which also, by the way, has a clear racial connotation, um, and that it uh, disadvantages people with darker skin. Sometimes whose faces don't even appear as faces to the algorithms. Um, and so lighting can be one. Um, there's also some evidence that like tone and cadence can be helpful. So uh, speaking clearly and at a you know, sort of reasonably um, consistent interpretable speed. And then also, I don't know, maybe trying to sound excited at certain points. But honestly, a lot of this is guessing and you don't really know um, what, it's, what it's interpreting. And I'll say that for, for some people, you can adjust to these systems to some extent. It's a fair question. And I think people, I understand why people would want to do that. Um, but it's worth recognizing that for many other people who have um, an atypical speech pattern or um, any type of atypical uh, facial structure, as well as, you know, we already mentioned accents and dialects or um, disabilities or even scars or, um, or, or skin genation. There's very little you can do about that, right? And so um, there's sort of, there are, there are some ways you can game them that they're probably unfortunately systemically unfair and, and individuals may never know or are very unlikely to know uh, why the system um, didn't find them compelling or, or found them to be a bad fit for a job. Uh, a sad commentary on our times that we have to sit here and provide how-to advice to uh, uh, job seekers on how to uh, deal with these algorithms. But uh, and Kim, you'll note, uh, any you'll thoughts? Note, that... You'll note none of that had anything to do with your qualifications for the job, right? I didn't, sure. I didn't do not one thing sure. I just said has anything to do with, you know, be better prepared, right? That's yeah, so it, was, it was all style of presentation. Yeah, and, how and that's a lot of what's happening. Yeah. Your actions. Uh, uh, Kim, any thoughts you yeah. have on? With the resume screening, there's actually... Um, websites that show you how to cheat. Uh, and one of the more clever things that I discovered, um, and, and they must have learned it from a college student, uh, but you take the keywords out of the job ad, you put them in your resume, but you put them in white lettering. So the algorithm picks up all the keywords, even though they're the, you know, if someone was looking at your Word doc, they wouldn't see them because they're all in white. Uh, students do that to get the right page counts. So at the end of their paper, they'll type a bunch of nonsense with white lettering and, oh, they met their word count, but you know, you don't see it because it's all in white. Interesting. Uh, we have another question from Herut. Uh, uh, this person wants to know, should the criteria that are being used in the employment algorithms 
be required to be made public? That's a really good question. Um, I think to a certain extent, uh, it, you could do that, uh, but with machine learning, it's so difficult to know what exactly the algorithm is measuring or, or giving prominence to. And in that case, the company would have really no ability to provide that type of information. I think it would be I think it would be difficult. Yeah, I agree. Um, the it, one because the the many of these are black boxes. They're using some random combination of features, some years of experience that it got from your resume, and something you put in on a form about your level of interest in the type of work, but also the tone of your voice. And these things get passed into crazy, nearly random combinations, and some. Uh, some outcome comes that um, says that you're um, uh, qualified or not. And so could you explain that situation? No, definitely not. There's, there's, uh, it's not even clear anything meaningful is happening. there. Um, and, you know, an important thing to remember is that sometimes the systems, this isn't to say all of them work like that. Some of the assessments, for instance, and some of the questionnaires might actually have clear connections to job skills, right? Your ability to solve uh, like a logic problem solving game might have some connection to your spatial awareness that's valuable for a certain type of job, right? That's not to say there's like no connection between algorithmic assessments and job outcomes, um, but in many of them, it's gonna be very, very hard to tell you what exactly happened. And it's not super clear employers care. An important thing to recognize is that these systems are fast and they require less uh, human time. So they're often cheaper than getting, and, and you can also evaluate many more candidates. Um, and so if you're a company that's hiring a whole ton of people, the point of this isn't necessarily, like the, the uh, most obvious value add isn't that it's fair or better, it's that it's faster and cheaper. Um, and that's an important thing to remember when sometimes people say, oh, they must, they must be less discriminatory or they must be effective or why would people use them? And the, the, I think the cheapness and the speed is, is an important um, metric as well. Okay, David has an interesting question. Uh, he asked, if there is discrimination in hiring, why does it matter whether it's done by AI or by humans? And he points out that psychologists have found that most humans make decisions uh, by intuition, not uh, on a rational basis, and that explanations are just rationalizations of non-rational decisions. And so uh, he's worried that human decision-making actually is no fairer or any more transparent than uh, AI and suggests that uh, the important criteria uh, uh, is the outcome in terms of the real measure of discrimination. So uh, any reactions to that observation? Well, there are some similarities with how um, discrimination law works uh, in the sense that it doesn't um, adequately cover subjective human decision-making because you're really trying to see in someone's head as opposed to uh, disparate treatment where you, you clearly see the result of uh, choosing one group over another. But it's kind of the same thing with uh, discrimination laws being applied to algorithms. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think there have been any um, employment lawsuits based on an algorithmic decision as of this time. And I think it'd be very difficult to prove. In the first case, it's very difficult to bring a, a prima facie case because what are you going to point to? Just because you were not selected for an interview does not, uh, does not provide enough evidence to bring a case to say that you were discriminated against. And then even if you were able to somehow get past that barrier, all the employer has to do is say, well, uh, it's a, le a, le a legitimate business decision to use the algorithm and that's their defense. And then the burden shifts back and you have to show that there's a, um, there's a better way to do it. Well, if you don't have a computer science background and you have no um, access to their algorithm, how can you possibly show there's a, a better, less discriminatory method to, do, to, to choose people? The, the yeah. law just has to be updated. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great point. I mean, so I'll just echo one thing and add one point, which is, you know, it's, 
it's sort of possible to prove discrimination in a hiring process as an individual if you're staring someone in the face and they say something incredibly racially or or someone emails you and say well the issue is your disability right um and like if if someone tells you i mean that's very uncommon but it's within the realm of reason that they can prove it um as an individual up against an algorithm I, I, there's functionally no chance there or there's there's or at least there's no one's done it so far um it's not clear how you do have any inclination that it was happening uh it, it's just it's it's almost completely impossible um as an individual without access to data and models and you know or without really any transparency into a system at all it's, it's um this is sort of a, a common issue you're going to see it in credit scoring as well where you have just no idea what's going into the model and so maybe you lose a little bit of the um private litigation angle maybe a little bit but the way i more typically think about this is that this is an opportunity Right? We have a real uh, opening to systemically reduce the amount of bias in decision making um, as we shift towards algorithmic approaches. I'm not arguing against the algorithmic approaches. I don't really care whether people use the algorithms or not. If company, Honestly, I don't really think it's the federal government's role to care if people are using the algorithms or not. Um, if uh, the companies decide that they're more effective or faster or cheaper, sure, fine. Um, but if they're going to, suddenly we have a very real opportunity to enforce um, discrimination laws in a way that have functionally never been enforced before. And I see absolutely no reason the that the federal government or other governments shouldn't say, hey, yeah, if you're going to use this cheaper thing, we're going to enforce these laws that have been on the books for decades that are incredibly important for an inclusive and equitable economy. Um, so you're, there is some real truth to the sense that I think it's very hard to look at the proliferation of algorithms and say things are definitely going to be worse or definitely going to be better. You just, the public just doesn't have enough information to make that um, judgment. There's definitely enough evidence that suggests concern. And there's, I think, a very strong reason to say that an intervention by governments and, and to create this sort of third party independent auditing um, and some accountability would be of, of great benefit. Um, that being said, yeah, by default, is it better or worse? I don't know. That's a, that's a sort of an unknown question. Hey, London Bennett has a question about the cybersecurity aspects of work surveillance tools, especially with uh, people working remotely from uh, their homes. Uh, he wants to know, can these tools be hacked to allow third parties to track employees as opposed to companies just monitoring their own employees? How big of a problem is hacking here? Oh, it's of course it's possible. <laughs> um, you know, we've had uh, people be able to uh, hack self-driving cars. I mean, I can't imagine they wouldn't be able to hack into your home computer. You know, one of the problems with remote working is at least, you know, in a lot of big companies, you have um, some type of uh, cybersecurity uh, measures on the servers and on their internet, whereas home, you know, you've got whatever <laughs> service provider you're using, you don't have the same level of security on your home computer that probably your work has on their computers. So there's a much bigger risk. In fact, the risk is um, a bad actor can get in through your home computer, find a way to get into the company's computer. That, I mean, to me, that would be a huge risk if if I was having workers work at home without um, sufficient security protections on their home computers. And of course, a lot of people are working from home over Wi-Fi networks, which are mm -hmm. far less secure than a hardwired network that you may uh, find in your office. Uh, Alex, your thoughts on the cybersecurity and hacking uh, aspects of uh, uh, workplace surveillance tools? That's a good question. You have to assume um, that there's going to be a market for this sort of uh, data breach, right, into uh, observation that includes GPS location and camera data of people who are working. At home. It's a lot of information about um, someone's house. You know, if you're on a work computer and you check your bank accounts, right? And you log in briefly to your bank and you put in your information, you know, there's, you can imagine that there'd be a very strong incentive for a cybersecurity breach. And I think 
Um, past evidence has shown us that if there's a strong incentive to get at the data, someone will in some capacity. Um, it's also, um, you know, sort of in the same vein, it's, it's very hard typically for a company that is like your company that builds widgets and or, or whatever, or, um, maybe edits documents, right? And you hire a, um, you use one of these things to observe people in their homes to see if they're really working, if they're on Slack, if they're editing documents. Um, and that's probably the thing you're evaluating. You're like, is this a good surveillance software? Um, the company and the individuals, there's just no chance they're gonna be able to evaluate its cybersecurity um, performance, right? And so like, this is an entire market that probably like many markets doesn't enforce and doesn't reward good cybersecurity. And so what happens is these companies proliferate and um, the ones with good safety features, like maybe they're the ones that sort of win the competition battle and maybe they're not. Um, and so like you have, you know, a market that doesn't really always reward cybersecurity and then um, a strong incentive to hack into these systems for personal information. And so, yeah, I would, I would assume it's a problem at, at some point. And I haven't seen those stories yet, but I, I think it's a reasonable bet to assume that they'll come out in time. And of course, at the beginning of COVID, we all naively thought this was going to be a four to six week uh, thing. And now it's a year uh, and uh, even uh, longer uh, than a year. And many of these remote work uh, features are likely to become a permanent feature of the uh, landscape. So what we initially might have thought was a short-term and temporary uh, adaptation to the pandemic uh, could actually become a long-term feature. And so therefore, we need to be thinking about these issues of uh, loss of privacy, uh, surveillance, cybersecurity uh, risks, and so on. Uh, Molly has a question about whether we need a regulatory agency that can oversee, monitor, and enforce privacy and keep people safe from some of these algorithms. Now, she does not draw a distinction on whether we need a new regulatory agency or whether one of our current regulatory agencies could perform this task. But uh, either one of you, do you think uh, we need someone to step up uh, to oversee and monitor what is taking place in uh, these areas? Well, there have been some calls to have the FTC expand their authority. Um, now, they, some argue that they already have the authority given that they monitor uh, unfair business practices, which could include what private corporations are doing with your data. Um, and then on the other side, of course, people are calling for a brand new agency uh, that is completely in charge of this. But um, what I would wanna see First, really, is the updating of the laws that apply to the government's use of data. The Privacy Act of 1974 uh, was updated in 1988, um, and that was meant to prevent the government from collecting all this data from people. It they passed it right after Watergate, so there was a, a huge concern of government spying on people. And I think uh, with this being written prior to, you know, widespread use of the internet, prior to social media, certainly, that um, there's a lot of things going on with the, with the government collecting our data that, um, to me, is not the intent of the laws we have in the book. But we just need to update all these laws, regardless of whether we have an independent agency that's monitoring uh, government and commercial use or you know, the FTC with commercial use, I think there has to be uh, some kind of, um, you know, uh, if someone has to create regulations because what we have right now is, is insufficient. So basically you think we need tougher policies and enforcement. Yeah. Uh, Alex, your thoughts on that? It's a really good question. Um, you know, I think the, most important thing is to start by enforcing current laws that exist. Some definitely need changing at the uh, regulatory level and the specific example we've been talking about, the EEOC has a set of rules called the Uniform Guidelines, um, which are sort of its interpretation of the um, 
and its regulatory interpretation of the laws that govern its, its oversight. And some of those just need to be reinterpreted in ways that reflect how algorithms work. Because you know, one of the things right now says if a feature, if a value or something, a, a feature of a person is predictive for their ability to do a job, then it's not, it doesn't count as discriminatory. Well, that's a problem with machine learning because everything's predictive. It's definitionally predictive. So like at the very least, there's a whole bunch of stuff that needs to be updated in light of what algorithms are doing. That's like the, the minimum step. Um, I also mentioned the need for capacity, right? At some point, we're going to need new people to come in, probably many more than we've hired so far to do this type of oversight, as well as some level of infrastructure, right? Secure uh, data access, the ability to go get this, the data and the models from companies, right? The literal legal authority to do that without having to go to a court case for every single new uh, data collection you're trying to do, um, as well as the ability to store it uh, securely. It is a problem if the government collects a whole bunch of corporate data and then that's hacked, right? That also is a very bad outcome for, for um, people, you know, as a corporate espionage perspective um, and also as an individual privacy perspective. Um, and so those, those things kind of have to happen. I'm a little agnostic to the FCC or not FCC. Um, I think there is, uh, you know, one argument um, for a new regulator is that you need a sort of new culture and a new set of skills. And if you look at like what the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau did, it was able to do a lot because it was building up sort of a, a fresh approach to a quantitative approach to, um, to financial analysis. And there was some value there. Um, some people have criticized the idea of a new agency, um, which is easier to create cor corporate capture. That is, uh, the companies that are doing this will be focused on influencing this single agency, um, which the FCC has has arguably been more resilient to. So there's really good arguments there. Um, I, I don't know if I have a really strong opinion so much as I'd like to see this enhanced capacity uh, exist. If there's any really specific thing, I feel is that lots of this involves um, domain expertise. So if you're going to, uh, you, you really have to understand the subject matter. So if you're going to improve algorithmic hiring systems, you have to understand hiring systems, which means the EEOC has to be involved. If you want to really improve how colleges are using algorithms to hire, uh, I'm sorry, to bring in students and to reward financial aid, you're going to need to understand um, uh, financial aid systems and then the Department of Education should be involved, right? You could say the same thing for uh, electronic health records and health uh, um, uh, bias and health systems uh, and health and human services and, and you, soon, you can go on. Um, and so sort of a little bit agnostic to where exactly the um, in, uh, investigatory capacity falls so long as it's joint with subject matter experts and it has these features that we need, the, the data collection, you know, legal authority, the technical capacity to secure data analysis, and then also the, the, the talent of the civil servants. Okay, uh, terrific points. So on that note, I want to thank uh, Kim and Alex for sharing each of your uh, thoughts. Uh, lots of uh, terrific ideas uh, there. Uh, clearly a number of things we need to worry about, but uh, each of you have some uh, possible solutions in uh, dealing with these uh, issues. I also uh, want to thank our audience for uh, tuning in. Uh, and uh, this video will be archived on the Brookings YouTube uh, channel. So if you want to share it with your uh, friends or there are other people who can be interested, please do so. Uh, we write regularly about uh, these topics of uh, AI uh, bias and AI uh, governance uh, questions. And you can find uh, that writing on our Tech Tank uh, blog and uh, through our Tech Tank podcast, uh, both of which are located at brookings.edu. So uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.